Uh, hopefully, we have audio clean. Everything is here. All right, great. Um, for those of you uh, who do want a room check, it is a talk about uh, real-time analytics, real-time insights, real-time dashboards, all things real-time data and stuff. Um, the, uh, the thing is working. Uh, camera is recording. Camera is, is recording. Camera is recording. Perfect. All right. So in, uh, in this presentation, I really want to talk about the interesting aspect that is kind of somehow can be um, seen as a final destination of the things, you know, a visualization of certain data. But I would like at the end of the talk kind of like broaden your um, view on those type of things. Like so each component of this like uh, uh, real-time dashboards will be breaking down and uh, I will explain some of the ideas how you start should start thinking about the data that you will be displaying. How many of you actually building some sort of like applications that users will be consuming and they will make some decisions based on the data that they will see? All right, few people, okay, good. Um, how many people here not building applications? Maybe you're in the data world, you're doing you know, infrastructure maybe, okay. I like when the people uh, have a, <laughs> the, the very vibrant uh, set of skills, not only. Um, I was wondering what the rest of the, what the group here are. What, what did you, like DBAs maybe? Database administrators? No? Um, so the, the idea of this, um, of this application is to provide a ability for the owner of pizza shop to make some sort of decisions that would be important for the business. And in order to do this, traditionally, we use uh, the analytics, a special type of queries where you can have a, uh, might be set of data, you might have a different uh, dimensions of this data, and you're trying to kind of like correlate, say how the sale depends on time of the day. It's quite an uh, interesting question that you can ask from your data, from your analytical data. Um, and the uh, visualization part is just a nice way for put this into um, in, in front of the eyes, uh, in front of the in front of the users. Now, uh, in uh, in this presentation, I will introduce you some of the architectural uh, the ideas that maybe some of you. Uh, how I like to put this, if you remember uh, Back to Future, um, you folks might not yet understand this, but your kids gonna love it. I think this is where we go into all the businesses, they become event driven and uh, data would be originated from events. And uh, less and less it would be transforming from the traditional, like a crowd application, create, read, update, delete, into more kind of like you, the data is, is arriving from somewhere. And after that, you will use the data to to, to query this data. I was um, um, giving an example to some of my friends is that um, I using a thing called Whoop. I don't know if you heard about this thing called Whoop. I'm kind of like a little bit on the fitness buff. And uh, it's actually constantly like uh, collecting my heart rate data for the sake of analyzing this and providing some of the insights for how I sleep, how I train, how I recover. And I never entered this data myself. I never went to the form and start typing, hey, that's my heart rate today. So the data will arrive somehow into the system, but every time I can pull up the, my phone, and inside my phone I can see the real-time dashboard that shows that the way how I slept, the way how I trained, what was my heart rate, which zones I would perform, and like I can correlate, make some notes, and saying, hey, yeah, um, it sounds like relevant information, and they will use this data to do some additional insights. Um, so that's why showing the data and getting some insights in the real time is very important um, for 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 the um, for many for many businesses, many applications. Now, uh, I started with pizza. Uh, I didn't. I don't have like AI angle in this talk as many speakers during this conference might have, so I use the uh, um, Midjourney to generate this title image. 
here we go. My talk uh, also included some AI, so I'm not missing out in uh, 2024. Uh, my name is Viktor Gamov. I work as a, a head of developer advocacy at the company called Startree. Uh, we are contributing to this open source project called uh, Apache Pino. We built managed service on top of the Apache Pino. And I, I wrote a book about Kafka. I wrote a book, Enterprise Software Development. So I, I've been, I, I just counted that my ninth dev nexus. It was crazy. Um, also, I'm known as uh, the person who builds uh, highly scalable, highly available, and sometimes, most of the times, over-engineered Hello World applications. And you will see, this will make sense in a few minutes. You will understand why. Um, with this, it is kind of a joke, but it's not a joke. All right. So uh, I will give you a brief overview how I and some of my colleagues see the current state of analytics. Uh, some of the things that you might uh, recognize, because uh, if you uh, ever uh, try to um, build any reporting system, you somehow touch the analytical aspect of you know, getting, to, getting to data. So uh, two axes. Uh, we have uh, x-axis, we have a type of analytics that called external and internal, and we have a real-time and the batch. So internal, any type of reporting that your boss is asking you to create for you, uh, for, for them, so they can make some sort of like a decision based on this. Uh, external is something that you are providing for your customers as some sort of like a service. Uh, it can be application feature, it can be dashboard, it can be um, some sort of like a report that they can click in the load, something that they, your users will touch. Um, and the batch in the real time should be self-explanatory. Uh, so we can have um, some, of the, uh, some of the data that will arrive through a uh, source of batch it needs to be available somehow through this uh, analytical queries. And also data needs to arrive through um, real-time sources, like messaging system, like a Kafka, Pulsar, Kinesis, or something like that. So let me put these uh, things into, um, into use cases first. So when we're talking about uh, internal and the batch, uh, oriented things. Uh, I have things with the reporting and the dashboards. Um, the, the, I probably don't need to explain this. Many of you either build or maybe use some solution like Crystal Reports. Anyone? Bert, Eclipse for my Eclipse folks. Okay, cool. Um, so when we're talking about uh, some sort of like a real time um, but stuff, something that your business would be interested, but not necessarily it's gonna be your core business. Any type of telemetry from your operations, your metrics, your logs, your traces, using things like you know, Grafana to, to show what is going on, what's the load average, what's the, uh, the space uh, on database left and things like that. Um, User-facing analytics. User-facing analytics. This is something that uh, your, your customers will get the reports. Say, if we're talking about the real-time, we're gonna spend a little bit more time talking about the uh, user-facing real-time analytics. Um, but uh, when we're talking about external and batch, you go into your uh, health insurance uh, provider, get the report of your or statement, or any, any type of report that you provide. It's still kind of like a stuff that your businesses uh, depend on, but it is, it's okay to calculate this data, you know, in overnight, over weekends, you know, it's, uh, your, your customers are probably okay to wait, uh, or at least you force them to think that they're okay to wait, even though, you know, we, we try, I'll try to convince that user-facing analytics is the a, is a, is a way to go, how to go about the future features in, um, you know, in, the, in the, the, the modern world. All right, so uh, some examples. Any type of data warehouses. Uh, we use this for internal and batch processing, uh, the batch type of uh, analytical applications. Um, you can run a lot of analytical applications using Hadoop uh, in the similar use cases. Uh, Snowflake is also a modern, but still kind of like a tr 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 traditional data warehouse style system. Uh, and uh, means to query this. Um, fantastic tool called Trino that allows you kind of like build some sort of like a federated query layer that um, allow you to um, execute those queries. BigQuery is a big, big system that allow you to run in internal and um, analytical applications. Uh, for something that you care 
for uh, something that you care for, your, for to run your business, things like Datadog or Funnels and all these kind of things. Um, the external, you can expose any type of these things uh, in order to perform and uh, scale for number of users who try to, um, to query this data. You can somehow put this into um, kind of like caching solution. Um, before, uh, some, some time ago, I was working for the company called Hazelcast. We were building a distributed caching solutions and you know, caching and speeding up databases based on um, you know, providing fast access to some of the data was our bread and butter. Um, and you know, one of the use cases is offloading some of the things from the data warehouses and make this available for fast query for applications or APIs. Uh, the systems, modern systems like Druid, Apache Pino, um, the, there's a ClickHouse, Rockset, so many, many of them uh, exist today. I'm going to be focusing on Pino because, in my humble opinion, it's the best, so that's why it goes very real and very external. So, uh, we have an interruption from our sponsor. So the, the company that, like I mentioned, the Star Tree, we're organizing the, uh, the, the conference called Real Time Analytics Summit. It is a um, place where people with like, ideas, people with uh, use cases like this come into and learn from uh, to experts. We have uh, speakers from Uber, we will have uh, speakers from LinkedIn, from Chartree, from Confluence, so many industry leaders. Um, and there's uh, uh, some, some code that you can use if you want to register. I also will be running a uh, full day uh, the workshop that will include Pino, Kafka, Flink. Um, so like really, if you want to really want to learn how to build those solutions, that's the great, um, the great opportunity for you to do this. So, uh, how many of you use the LinkedIn today? Still few. I bet that answer to these questions five years ago or six years ago would be different because many people would say that, yeah, I use, I use LinkedIn, but uh, I use it, I don't know, last time when I was trying to apply for a new job. And it was for a very long time. You have a question? Uh -huh. Yes. When you use the web, you also have what issues? I will explain. Yes. Um, real time in a human understanding or human perception of time. I'm not talking about real time systems when you need to kind of like uh, perform operations with the nanoseconds. I'm talking about seconds or a fraction of seconds, something that human can per perceive. And I will explain this, how this will uh, relate to real-time example of LinkedIn. So um, many uh, the uh, people who worked on LinkedIn, they thought, OK, how we can improve the work um, of this like a social network so the people hang out in LinkedIn more? Because they probably hang out on Facebook because it's much funner. There's no one saying, like, I'm going the, to LinkedIn to, uh, to do something cool. So they were thinking, OK. What about we come up with this feature because we already have this data, you know, we know who's clicking your profile. How about we take this data and show it to you as a, as a feature of our application. So you can go there and check, Victor, why I want to know this information. I'll give you an example. That it's actually not my example, it's an example from one of my friends. Um, and uh, he said that I use this feature a lot when I go and uh, have interviews. They, they do the job interviews, and they go and see if there's some people from the company that he applied to also saw his profile. And uh, he sees kind of like his rate of success uh, going, uh, going higher and higher when he sees that some person who interviewed him or maybe his boss or their boss will go and see his LinkedIn profile. So that's why for this person who is applying for this job, this information is relevant like today. If I would send him a report, or LinkedIn would send him a report like next month, it's, it's already too late. Okay, so who cares if uh, the people from the company that I applied uh, today uh, watched my LinkedIn profile uh, and I learned this like a mo one month after. So information, 
this type of information. It needs to be available and it needs to be fresh. How it can be done? So LinkedIn also known as a place where the Apache Kafka was created. A lot of things that happens in LinkedIn generate a lot of events. And Apache Kafka is a perfect place where all these events uh, will be shoved. When it's uh, lent in the Kafka, every application inside LinkedIn can use this data. So they start thinking, okay, so how we can use this data? We know who clicked your profile. We need to get this data immediately. We cannot wait for overnight because of the use cases that I mentioned. Um, and uh, your friend or your colleague or someone that you uh, follow post some of the news update. You also want to know this because LinkedIn, uh, as, a, as a social network, wants to give this information for you so you can congratulate this person. You know, you've probably seen uh, every time when someone uh, shared information that, hey, I'm, I'm starting a new job and everyone is uh, starting to comment. Then the, the news feed also built on top of the similar same, same data. It's different dimensions, um, and this is kind of like a, uh, the query that technically can generate this data, uh, can generate this uh, the news feed. Um, and uh, just to give you a number, uh, how many people will be interacting with these features? Over 700 million people will interact with this feature. So high concurrency, very, very big rate uh, number of, of queries, and data needs to be fresh because the, the you know, new events will come every second. You want to have updated version. Another example where freshness and uh, importance of having this uh, kind of like a in human perceived real time is uh, restaurant management. So yours, you, you um, probably, uh, you know, uh, if you travel or maybe you just like uh, don't want to cook uh, anything today, you're just ordering from the Uber Eats. And uh, di different ways how we can go about this. You can see like uh, what kind of restaurants available in your area and um, how fast is delivery time. So you see it's already analytical query, right? Because it's uh, multiple dimensions. You have a ge geospatial uh, use case. And after that, you have a um, um, time, uh, time domain, like what's the ETA to deliver the certain stuff. Also, as a, as a uh, Uber should know what's the, what's the load of the restaurant. Like, because probably if the, everyone is ordering from one uh, restaurant, uh, the wait time would be longer. Um, this is what you see. This is what you see as a user. But also, uh, for Uber, a restaurant manager, the person who uh, connects their business to Uber is also a user because uh, it is kind of like other side of the thing. So it collect, uh, connects the user consumer and the businesses. So for Uber, providing this type of information for their users, they know that, okay, so right now we, we see the revenue, we see the orders, we see what is going on, uh, what's the top selling items, so we can plan up, uh, up front, like if I want to order more, um, I don't know, like a tomato pasta for, uh, for, my, uh, for my tomato pizza sauce, I need to call my vendor today, not tomorrow, when I receive the report from this and I like, don't have any items. Because in a bigger restaurants, people who will be responsible for cooking your food and people who are responsible for supporting the business, usually different people. So you know, people who will be uh, responsible for logistics, they need to get this information earlier so they can call the vendors, the vendors start um, the, the doing the stuff and things like that. And uh, my small... Um, my small pizza shop also uh, will, um, where's my, uh, my camera? Lost focus for some reasons because I move too much. Here we go. Now, let me break down what kind of stuff I will show you as, a, as a my demo application. So, we do have a simulated order service. Order service um, where people will go on the mobile app or they'll try to call the API to generate this order. In my, this particular case, in order to make this interesting, I need to generate some data. So I have just a Kafka producer that will be sending the, uh, many orders into my Kafka topic. So, uh, I also have a catalog 
of products that will be uh, stored inside my uh, MySQL database. And uh, this information I need uh, because I want to um, join information about uh, product ID that I have in my order information with actual product. So I want to have more rich information or enriched information. So for that, I will be using Kafka Streams, which is a Java framework. It's a built-in framework for Apache Kafka. Um, you can use, um, if you want something else, uh, Apache Flink is a great option in our option. I do have a demo that uses the, the Python-based framework called Bytewax that does the like, same thing, kind of like a enrichment or like joining two streams. So when I have my enriched orders uh, inside the Kafka topic, I will be able to uh, tell the Apache Pino to you know, read this information and make it queryable. So um, there are some options uh, to how you can query the Kafka. It's, a, it's another secret. So you can even use Kafka Streams to build small microservice that will aggregate this data and expose the data through some sort of API using um, the thing called interactive queries. Here's the problem with interactive queries. Same problem that um, I might experience in the past when I was talking about distributed caching solution. These things work fastest if you know the key. If you know the key, the access to this data almost instantaneous. But sometimes in analytical queries, you don't know the key. You want to know things around some averages. So you need to have indexes. You need to have something that will be running um, this. So that's why the solutions like uh, Kafka streams, um, that some distributed cache Redis will not going to fit in this particular case. Apache Pino have certain capabilities that I will explain in a second that makes it I perfect for this use case. But uh, displaying this data is not one of those capabilities. So, uh, and it's it's great because you know you need to something. You you either building your application, you will be building APIs, or you're building um, something that will be building the UI for you. So uh, API, uh, the UI for you. So I, in this particular case, I will be using a thing called Streamlit. It's a Python framework. I just use it because I can take literally query from, uh, from the Pino and uh, throw this, uh, to this framework and it will draw the nice uh, diagrams. Um, another option, I'll show you how you can use tool called Apache uh, Superset that can, you know, that how you can also build this type of dashboards, not necessarily expose this to outside world, but it also would be uh, very useful for, um, uh, for some of the internal information. Uh, we're gonna start with the service. Data goes from the database. Kafka Streams for enrichment. Pino for user-facing queries, and each query will represent certain piece of functionality that we will build in our dashboard. And uh, the Streamlit will be responsible for showing this. Code is available. Um, it is dockerized, doesn't use cloud, doesn't use anything. So feel free to uh, download this, play around this. If something doesn't work, let me know. I will fix. Or maybe you have some, some also cool ideas. I will add this to the demo as well. Yes. Let's go to that previous slide. Uh, what's the uh, what's the uh, dashed line? Is that a uh, like a microservice boundary? Um, dashed line is basically something that um, uh, will be part of of this kind of like a bigger solution. I just wanted to emphasize that the things that would be important for uh, for Pino. Another point is that um, usually when I do this presentation at this point, someone in the audience will ask. What about joins? Um, yes, uh, joins supported on the Pino, so you can actually uh, get the data from database and uh, get the data from Kafka and do join inside the Pino. Uh, it's, it's fully supported. Um, as a, one of the good examples, and Tim, maybe correct me, that we recommend to our customers is to do like a pre-joining stuff. Uh, Tim is a, our local uh, member of my team and also um, he's leading our like a field engineering team. Um, doing some sort of like a pre-joining stuff using the frameworks that exist to do this. So that's why Kafka Streams is ideal for doing stuff or, or, or Flink to do. Um, so those things are replaceable. Um, I do, we do have a, another example. Uh, I need to find the link, but uh, we do have example. I'll show you at the end, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil this. So stick around, I'll show you at the end how we can do the joins inside the Pino uh, without uh, using like a third party tool. 
Uh, let me show you this link one more time if you, if you need to take a picture um, to, uh, to, to get this, this data. Uh, S3.ai slash pizza demo. That's the URL that you can, you can find. All right. Cool. So the way how this would look like, uh, let me show you in the very end game. That's the how this application would look like. And for my, the, for my folks who love the dark mode, I can do this as well. Uh, not me, but the, this is awesome framework that I use for visualization. So there's a bunch of things going on here. So one of the things that uh, this data is uh, is uh, constantly running and collected number of the orders for the one for the last minute. So uh, in the real life, you have orders that would be generated by some sort of like uh, the user facing application. In this particular case, it's just like a system that generates this order. Um, there's a query that gets the, uh, the, the revenue <laughs> for the last minute. Uh, it's kind of bold, right? So not bad, not bad for, uh, for, uh, for the last minute. Uh, and uh, uh, average, um, but it's, it's, I guess it's, uh, it goes in uh, rupees, um, not in dollars. So the next thing is that orders per second. So how many orders have happened uh, within, the, the, within the second? And we have the nice graphs. Um, and we do have, uh, um, let me see, let me refresh it if it's, uh, yeah, it works. Um, uh, we want to see this revenue goes up because it's always nice to see when the revenue training up. Um, each of this component will have its own query that will be running against the Pinot, yes? Sorry, I, I don't know if anybody else, I'm, with the lights and everything on the darkness, it's a little harder to see the level. I can do, I can do, I can do white. That's all totally fine. Again, don't blame me, the blame uh, the projection system. Um, <laughs> But I can do this for you with the light one. Is it better? Yeah. All right. OK. So we do have a most popular uh, categories of the products. Uh, again, uh, the, the uh, top five. And uh, we also have these most popular items. And um, the, um, this dashboard is like auto refreshes after f every five minutes. On the, um, when, we, when we need to kind of like, in the very beginning, everything starts with, um, where's my SQL Studio? Let me show you what we have in database. Pizza shop. E pizza shop, so I have a product. Um, you probably don't see it. And uh, we do have a catalog of a product. The way how it works right now, we just went and scraped the Pep Papa Jones, the, the website, and upload this data here. So it will use more or less realistic data. Um, and all this uh, uh, different uh, type of uh, the pizzas is all there. So this is our kind of like operational data store that we'll use as, a, as our catalog. Um, and uh, in, this, in this system, we have um, element of event-driven system, element of real-time system. So we have a Kafka to generate all these orders. So um, every time someone places order, this order will land into this Kafka topic. Uh, and the order would look something like this. So, uh, nope. Uh -huh. Let's do this bigger. So I think that, that would be big enough. So we have an order ID created. Uh, who created this order? Uh, we have a user database as well. We can also uh, join this. Um, what's the status of this order? And we have a bunch of items inside the order. Product ID, but there's no information about the product. So that's why we're going to need to enrich the stream in order to get the enriched information. So um, for that, I'm using Kafka Streams. Kafka Streams, it's a, it's a Java framework. There's a other frameworks available for um, uh, different uh, languages that will do similar things. And idea is to get the orders from the order stream. Um, every like a Kafka topic will be represented as a stream or table inside the Kafka Streams. If you um, if you don't know about Kafka Streams, I actually did a few 
years back did presentation about Kafka streams at the DevNexus, so there might be video available somewhere. Or you know where to find this. Uh, if there would be some Kafka stream presentation, most likely you will find it here. Uh, Kafka streams. Here we go. Bunch of Kafka streams presentation. Again, it's not advertisement, just a friendly reminder where we can find all the information um, about this, uh, this presentation. Now, I'm taking the order that looks like this. And uh, the, in, uh, in the one of the operators that are available for Kafka stream, so it's called flat map, we're creating another stream that will be exposed. Um, and uh, we taking this uh, stream and uh, creating for each individual order item, we're creating uh, individual order record, let's call it. So we have one order. After that, we have a stream of orders, which includes only one order item. And after that, I'm joining this with the stream uh, of uh, data that comes from the product, uh, product catalog. Uh, in the real life, what you will be using is something called CDC or change data capture. So you will be listening to the changes that happen in your database and push the changes into Kafka. Or you will be using batch job to, um, to push this data um, somewhere where the Pinot can download this afterwards. Uh, but in this particular case, we have a product that also will be inside the Kafka topic, and after that, we join. We push this data into another topic that is called that is called enriched order items, and our final look of this would look something like this. We will have our order information. We're trying to create like a flat structure structure that would be ideal for uh, doing uh, analytical type of query. Uh, product information, that now includes not only product ID, but also full description, uh, URL, price, and all this information that um, we can take and push into Pinot. Now, in order to make it work with Pinot, we need to tell uh, how the Pinot can download this information. So inside my Pinot, I do have, where's my tables? Um, this will land all these orders information land into this order items enriched topic. Um, and this is the number of the items that is currently from Kafka inside my Pinot. The way how it works in, in the Pinot, we have this uh, the configuration that I need to say, hey, there is a, uh, where's the table? Yep. There is a, Kafka broker that you need to connect in order to get this data. So, and the Pino will go there and the fetch this data and it will be continue, um, continue floating inside the Pino. And this will land into this uh, the table that will have a time of real time. So in this case, this is the table that will be constantly updating, data will be flowing in. And um, um, if we need to do what we call like upsort, some of the data will have a new value for the same key. Pino will take care of doing this type of thing. We also have a thing called offline table. So in this case, there would be job that will push data inside the Pino, comparing to real time table when the Pino will be pulling data in. And there's also a hybrid model where uh, both uh, things are supported. Now, uh, as a, as, a, as a tool to explore what we have in this data set, we can use, uh, we can use this, this is super cool, uh, uh, the, the Pinot console that comes with the, with the tool. Yes, please. So Pinot is more like a cache. No, Pinot is database. Like it's the, your analytical database where you will be querying for whatever information. It's a place where you're putting your data that you will be building the dashboards on top of. Yes. So the real-time one is using memory, right? The offline one is using I/O, right? Uh, no, it's uh, it's it's uh, every every data. I will have a I have a slide that explains how the segments works. So every time you will read the data from Kafka, it will land to the segments. Some of the data will be available in memory, but it will be dumped into the file. And when you need to query, it will be queried from the file from the segment. Even though it's a real-time, it will persist. Yes. Yeah, 
as a, a, as a user, as a kind of like a person who will be writing the query against, uh, there would be no kind of like a difference. Only thing that you'll see like how fast data will be, you know, coming in into the system and Pino will make sure that some of the data that would be not longer used will be placed in what we call uh, deep storage. And uh, if this data eventually will be needed, Pino will re-download this back. Maybe it will skew your kind of like a P99 type of uh, latency on the, on the queries, but in general, uh, this should not affect like, significantly your, um, your performance of your, of your application. So you can play around with the queries here. For example, I do have um, a query that you can also grab from, um, from this uh, repository, say, I want to do uh, top five, uh, top five uh, categories for the last five minutes. So I'm putting this here, run the query, and I get the results. It's cool, it's nice, you know, and you can play around. I would recommend to use something that uh, looks much nicer. So I use this uh, superset. Superset has a built-in integration with Pino. If you do say, where's the database superset? Um, there's a bunch of data sets. Let's see, like this order enriched, um, not this is one. I think, I think I messed up something, let's see me. Dashboard, simple dashboard, if it still works. Yeah, I, I think I broke something. Yep. Yep. See more, let's see, let's see. Uh, broker resources missing here. So it looks like my uh, superset lost connection. I probably can restart my Docker Compose, but I believe the, it will lost my configuration. Let me try this. Um, you know, it's a live demo, you know, what, what could go wrong? Docker, Docker Compose down, and I'm not gonna re uh, remove everything, so it will stop all the components. And, um, Let's see if I will lose uh, my configuration inside the uh, superset. If not, uh, I can show you how this can be recreated. You already saw the, the thing work with the dashboard, so uh, it's okay. Yes? In terms of uh, and, uh, would be equivalent to like a data break? Pino would be equivalent to something like a Apache Druid, um, maybe, uh, what about data bricks? Click house. So it's a perfect segue to talk about uh, about a perfect segue to talk about architecture. While my demo trying to recover itself, hopefully, um, let's talk about the, the 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 perfect 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 segue. Yes, a question, and after that we'll go next. Yes. Uh, yes, there is a ways how those things can be uh, can be implemented, modeled, and solved in in the Pino. Yes, yeah. So when we're talking about the OLTP database, uh, your MySQL, <laughs> this database enforces certain not enforce it uh, implies certain rules. For example, like ACID rules, right? Atomicity, consistency, isolation, transaction isolation, and durability of the data. And usually, with the OLTP databases, you care about uh, raw integrity. When you inject, uh, like inserting something, you in insert into uh, click. Um, uh, user click, blah, 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 uh, IP, user ID, remote user time, request status bytes, values, and after that you put the values. So you care about like uh, um, the, the raw of the data, like a raw in, in, in database. Or it can be if you do transactions, you insert multiple things in closed transactions. So that's the important part. Um, can you use uh, OLTP databases to perform the, some sort of like analytical queries? At some extent. 
it's uh, you know uh, depends on uh, how you what what type of queries do you want to execute how the many the dimensions that you need to imply this what's the um, what's the the uh, complexity of the queries, how, how many like uh, uh, tables you need to join in order to perform this query, this type of things. So in order to implement all this lab stuff, people start doing ETL jobs, right? So you, you need to extract the data from your operational source, which is usually it's the OLTP, um, and uh, move into somewhere where you can like, uh, do maybe pre-aggregation, shuffle data around, and after that, uh, you know, turn this into something that would be uh, available for analytical queries. So in the Pino concept of table, as in many uh, modern data systems, it is more like a, the, the concept, is an abstraction. Um, the technically, uh, or like physically, this table contain, uh, contains multiple segments. In the different systems, you might heard things about partitions, shards, and all these kind of things. Think about this as a the, the similar, similar term, but in terms of Pino, it is, uh, we call it segments. And the way how the segments are structured, in order to perform um, in the, you know, fast perform, it stores the data not in the raw format as a kind of record, but as a columnar format. So we do have a, like, the, each uh, segment will have some sort of you know, description that will get the, the, the key element here and put them as a column name. And the uh, rest of this data will be stored in these in this segments. And those segments can be, um, uh, can be replicated for, uh, for durability reasons and for optimizing some, some of the queries. And the data will be stored. So like in our particular case, in, the, in this example, everything will be stored uh, inside the servers. And those are, would be spread across the servers. Um, this very clever name, servers, that will be you know, serving the data. There is a component, Pino has many components. It's a, it's a super cool system to talk in a distributed system symposium or, or meetup and things like that. Uh, but I'm trying to be like very, uh, Talking about only only important important uh, points that will explain to you like how it works. So when we uh, when we when we uh, write our query, we talk into broker, and broker would be responsible for um, taking this query and uh, uh, scatter this into uh, multiple servers that will include this data. And for example, if we need to execute something from uh, get the data from that only available in segments two and eight. Broker will be responsible, send the queries only to these two servers. And this data uh, will be queried, and the result would send, uh, send back to, to broker and send them back to application. So clients talking to broker, my, uh, my application is connected to broker. Uh, data will be um, received on the broker side of things. And uh, the jobs that will be ingesting data will be ingesting data into segments. So this is, can be like batch process or this can be like a Kafka process. So uh, with the batch ingestion, we call it like offline table and there would be a separate uh, minion process that will be responsible for getting data from your file, chunk it up and uh, put them inside the segments. So what's the difference between the columnar and the raw based uh, style of storing things? So in the raw you have IP, uh, time, uh, request time, uh, some additional information of the browser, and after that, your data. In the columnar world, you will have one column that says IP, and all possible values that you have in your, um, in your IP information throughout all this data set, this information would be stored in this column. Same thing for your uh, browsers, same thing for some additional information. Why it's done? Based on uh, certain uh, aspects of cardinality of the data, like how, how different data or how the same data it can be applied, um, we can apply certain 
I don't know, like a compression or some, some smart indexing in order to reduce the size because some of the data of IP addresses can be repeated, right? It is, uh, we're not uh, talking about third normal form anymore. It's a, it's a one big flat table, basically. So we, th there will be some duplicates. And we can optimize those duplicates by uh, implementing some sort of like a compression logic or whatnot. So for, um, for this type of record, each individual segment will include all information about the, the IP addresses, possible IP addresses, possible user IDs, possible remotes, blah, 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 and all those kind of things. And it will be pushed inside, uh, inside the Kafka, or inside the, inside the pinup. With Kafka, uh, the process will work uh, similarly but some of the segments will store, stay in the memory, and over the time, they will be pushed back into, uh, into the disk segments. The uh, main goal of this particular approach is to make data from Kafka available for query immediately. There was a question in the Slack channel uh, some time ago when someone asked, like, how fast this data will appear? This data will appear as soon as it will be consumed from the Kafka. This data will be available for query immediately. So that's one of the uh, cool um, uh, ways how you can query stream from the Kafka topic. Um, the, there's a Slack. I want to show you one, uh, one more thing here. Let's see if, uh, if, my, if my demo recovered. Here we go. Like super set, not today. So uh, hopefully my streamlet uh, back in, in the bank. Okay, you make tables. Sometimes tables are, here we go. So my streamlet uh, the back, uh, back, in, back in the game. So I wanted to show you like how the superset will be used because superset allows you kind of like a click ops based on some of the dashboard that you can figure out what kind of data you can use. And after that, you know, you either uh, implement this, you know, you can use stream, stream set, um, uh, superset as a prototype tool. And after that, just tell your developers like what you want to implement in terms of APIs and, and things like that. So the way how the streamlet works um, is actually pretty cool. I never used this one before, um, before I started, you know, the, the working with the pin and stuff. And I found this like very fascinating for also quickly, um, quickly um, prototyping this like, data intensive application. So essentially, it is uses uh, official uh, Pino driver for Pino, or for, um, uh, the, for Python. And uh, so what it does, every time I need to execute query, um, getting connection, um, executing this query, getting results, and after that, shove these results into, uh, into Streamlit in the way how it, uh, you know, the, will be visualized. They have a multiple different components and uh, like every step it will execute the Pinot query. Um, before, uh, before we part, uh, before we part, I promise to show you um, there's a quick start project that I'm currently working. As you can see here, it is still a little bit in the, in the, in the private mode. Um, but what I wanted to show is that um, we do have a two type of table in this particular use case. One uh, table called uh, movies. It is a table that is, um, where is it? A job spec. So this is the, this is the job spec that uh, will be up uploading the batched or like offline tables. So in this, uh, in this particular case, I'm, I'm showing what's the record format of this data in my JSON file. And uh, so the Pino can understand the different uh, data that's there, JSON, Avro, Parquet, I believe it also supports. So there's a bunch of different uh, the, the, the formats that support it. Where to find this data? Um, it can be local directory, it can be S3. You can uh, download this data immediately from, from S3. And um, uh, where to push it? Um, and the data with, uh, with movie data from file, file would look something like, I should have it something data, would look something like this. This is movie JSON data. Each, 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 uh, each line will represent a movie, for example, like, like Goonies, right? Um, uh, let me do it just bigger, bigger. Can I do bigger? Yeah. Now, um, that's offline data. And uh, imagine I have a use case where, the, um, where we have this data uh, arriving inside uh, your system through Kafka. Where's the tables? Where's the table? 
and this uh, no, wrong, the table table information. So user clicking on the website ratings will land in, in the Kafka topic and after that we do have a topic that will include data comes from the real time from uh, from um, from uh, from from the Kafka data and we once it's landed in the Pino we will be able to do something like this without doing any type of pre-joining without doing any type of uh, third party system we can get information about the movie and the um, rated movie information where we have um, ratings data that come in the real time table and the movie information that comes from our like a catalog of, of the movie in the offline table. And as a result, we can get this, we can run this query you know, as many, as many times as we want because it would be part of our application. Um, Pino support very good uh, the concurrency in terms of like you can plug this without kind of like a caching system, any type of cache, so you can expose this to, you know, to, to application that will be reading this data and showing to your users. Um, so that's the, that's the, that's the, um, uh, that's the Pino side of things. Um, this is the places where you can find um, questions, uh, concerns, um, emotional distress with regards to um, analytical databases uh, or like some use cases where you start playing around with Pino. Um, it's kind of interesting because we have a <laughs> two slacks. Um, we have a, the official Apache Pino slack, which is uh, uh, all about Apache Pino. If you uh, have a questions about the Star Tree products, we do have a slack um, that goes into um, like the Star Tree. That's the Pino Slack, um, and you can ask the questions about Star Trek Cloud and how it works in integration with the third parties and stuff like that. Yes. Um, and I don't mean to pigeonhole it uh, where this should go, but it seems like very good for like data mesh. Uh, would that be true, or is it? I'm not an expert in this topic. We have a, I have a, the person who knows more on that mesh is Hubert, my colleague, uh, but he I, I didn't bring him with me today. Um, he, he actually working on the, uh, he has a book about uh, data mesh, so you can, uh, you can hang out with us in a Pino Slack and ask this type of question. So that's the, that's the use case. And again, um, I hope um, uh, you, this talk was uh, interesting enough, so you will be interested to join us at the Real Time Analytics Summit, where we can be talking about all things Apache Pino, all things about the real-time analytics and all this type of stuff. Um, as always, uh, my name is Victor Gamov. I always available until the end of today for any type of enhanced interrogation if you if you want uh, to you know ask me right now or ask me after. Um, I didn't mention this, but you probably seen this. I am. You can find me. You can find me on Twitter and also ask those type of questions on Twitter. With this, my name is Victor Gamov, and as always, have a nice day.